Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis, which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep it on a daily basis. On Finding Peace, this is the podcast where we talk about daily life tips in helping us find our inner peace, things that we can do practically, uh, maybe even on a daily basis that will keep us in that mode of our own peacefulness. And I'm very pleased uh, to have with us today uh, our guest, uh, Coleman Baker. And we're going to be talking about finding that power within us when it comes to how do we decide what actions to take to make changes in our lives. This is a topic that I write a lot about, but I think it's a topic which is very important because it's filled with empowerment. So it'll be great to uh, hear from uh, Coleman Baker about his views on this and uh, very pleased to have you with us. So thank you. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So uh, if you want to talk a bit about yourself, your background, what you do, and then we'll jump into uh, your whole point of having the power within each of us. Sounds great. Yeah. So um, I was a minister for 10 years and um, uh, left the ministry only to pursue a PhD. Um, at, at the time, the goal was to, instead of serving actively as a minister, to uh, earn a PhD to go on to train future ministers. That was, that was the goal. Um, what, no one told me when I started that journey is that um, the job market for full-time professors in religious studies is terrible. And so, um, you know, I finished the PhD. I and I, still is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, really challenging. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I taught part-time, I still teach part-time online courses um, and, and, and really find a lot of value in doing that. Um, I really, uh, love that, that part of, of my life, but it's just not a significant part of, uh, what I really do anymore. And, uh, so I had to, you know, really sort of wrestle with what am I going to do now? What, and, and the thing that I finally landed on and the thing that, um, you know, the place I find it just gives me such meaning and such joy is working with, I'm also, I've, I've become a certified life coach. I'm also a certified meditation teacher. So I, I work with clients from all over the world and uh, help them do two things. One is to help overcome compulsive, destructive habits. I, I help clients identify uh, what habits that, that, that are ruling their lives, that are harming them, harming others, harming their relationships. Uh, most clients come to me knowing what it is. And, 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 and we, we, we develop a system in which they can, uh, they can really get a hold of that. And then the second thing is to start really living life on their terms, uh, determining who they want to be and where they want to go and, and helping them put together action plans to be able to get them there. Um, so that's what I'm all about now. And uh, I tell you, uh, Chris, uh, it's, it's uh, every, I wake up in the morning and I look at the list of clients I need to talk to and I get tired just looking at the list. But by the end of the day, when I hang up with that last client, I feel such a great sense 
um, that I'm really making a difference in the world. And, uh, and, and I just love what I'm doing. And that's awesome. You know, I think that makes the world a difference that when you not only enjoy what you do, but you see the outcomes of what you're doing and you can really know without a doubt that you're making a difference. And to me, that's just, uh, yeah, really it leads us to get to our peace. It really does. I, you know, one of the things that I do, I, I just, the, I mean, a basic, uh, rundown is uh, a 10 week coaching program. And, you know, when I, I recently, I had a couple of clients finish up their 10 weeks and I do that last call with them. And we have the conversation about reflecting on where they were when, uh, when we started. And, you know, I do them on uh, through Zoom. And so, you know, often my, with my clients, I'm looking at them on the camera. Um, and most of the time there's a, there's this such a difference, not only in the way that they look at life and the way that they're engaging with me, but, 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 but you can, uh, it, visually you can tell a difference, uh, in, in the way that these guys look and, 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 and present themselves. And it's just so rewarding to see, to, to feel like I'm a, I'm a small part in, uh, in making that kind of a difference in, in others' lives. Yeah, and, and it is an awesome feeling. So, uh, you know, really appreciate what you're doing with that. And, you know, I, I noticed on your website and looking over the work that you do, it seems a lot of what you talk about is taking action. Uh, you know, like you say, you, you know, you deal with meditation, although I make the case that meditation is taking action. But yeah, absolutely. a lot of this is about action. Why mm -hmm. is that? so important for making these changes, you know, within ourselves and, and our habits and all, all of that, that, that you see with your clients. The, 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 the guy that I call my coach uh, and, and, and good friend now, Craig Para, he, he says this all the time. And it was the first time I'd ever heard it when he said it to me, um, the actions you take is the life that you make you want you you look at your daily actions the actual things you're doing and that is what determines what kind of life you're living uh, one of the things i do with with my clients is we we gauge their level of of satisfaction in different areas of their lives and when i ask them to gauge those levels of satisfaction i'll say you know put a number by it one to four are you Satisfied, unsatisfied, you know, where are you? But then, but then I asked them to write down underneath that, what actions did you take or not take that led to that outcome? Because that's what's real. What, what, whatever, wherever you are in life, it is the direct result of the actions you have taken. And, and that does make sense. So although... I get a lot from my clients that will say, but this circumstance was out of my control and it happened and I was affecting me or yeah, similar type phrases that, you know, I get hit with a lot. So how do we counter that based off of what you're saying that, you know, it is our actions that influence it? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Obviously um, there are things that are going to happen in life that we can't influence. Um, I think one of one of the most primary things that we have to get a hold of is is making that clear distinction between what we can control and what we can't. Right? Um, you can't control most things outside of you, but you can always control yourself. Um, another another mentor of mine uh, used to say all the time: "It's not what happens around you that matters; it's what happens in you." It's what's, what's going on inside of you. So, yes, um, obviously there are going to be circumstances that are going to arise in our lives that we have no control over and that we can't do anything about, but are going to influence us one way or the other. But here's, I mean, here's um, the way I come at this. 
Um, and I just recently wrote a blog post and I'm going to do a video uh, about this fairly soon. Okay. And uh, it, it's about, it's just this, this, this phrase that another friend of mine came up with. He says, life is like the game of Tetris. You know, if you remember the game of Tetris, it's, you know, this, I won't explain the, the game too much, but those of you that remember the game, remember that, the, you know, you get these random tiles that drop from the top of the screen and you have to figure out where to put them on your board to try to get solids across the bottom and make them disappear, right? Right. But these random tiles are going to show up and you can't control what next, what tile is going to come next. And the further you get in the game, your board will develop and you'll need a particular tile. And, and inevitably, you won't get that tile. And the more time we spend getting irritated and bothered about the tile that is there, the less time we have to actually deal with it. And I think that's how life is like Tetris. You, we can't control what's coming next. We never can. We can't control that. But what we can do is just accept what's there as soon as it arises and then what and then ask ourselves what actions can I take within what is to to create the best possible outcome? So yeah, for those that would say, you know, there are these circumstances, these things that happen out here that I can't control and they're having a negative effect on me, I would say I understand that these things are gonna happen. But the place that we get into trouble is when we start wishing things were different than they are and getting stuck in that cycle of wishing things were different, but things aren't different. And so I don't know what I'm going to do and I can't do anything about this. The reality is if we can just accept things exactly the way that they are, and then from that vantage point, critically evaluate, now what can I do? Because we can always do something. And if we can look at circumstances objectively and, and, and bring to it our own power of choice and our own ability to take action to create the life that we want, then, then, then we're going to be coming at whatever it is out there from a much better vantage point than this thing happened to me and I can't do anything about it perspective. And, and that's awesome, and I would totally agree with what you're saying, especially when you're talking about the concept of acceptance. Would you say that the acceptance of the reality, whether it's generated from within or impacted from without, does this acceptance become part of the process for breaking the cycle? Yeah, I think it does. I think it absolutely does. Um, and, 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 and it's a matter of just waking up to that reality, um, of realizing that I'm stuck in this cycle of not accepting what is. And, you know, that just comes with elevating our own awareness around what's there. And every time, and whenever we realize it, I mean, we've all, we've all got this, at least most of us, I guess, um, have this voice in our heads, this running narration, right? Um, and for a lot of us, it's a very negative, or at least there's a, there's one that's very negative and, you know, learning how to, to interact with that negative voice that's telling us all these things and keeping us stuck in this cycle is a way to, uh, just learn to accept what is and reject the stories about what is. I think that's a clear distinction that we can make is there's, there's reality. And then there are the stories that we create in our heads about reality. And if we can learn to make a distinction between what's real and what the stories that are created in our head, then we can be a step closer to breaking free from that cycle and just accepting what is. Why do you think it's so difficult for us to accept? Or maybe I should rephrase it because maybe you don't think it's so difficult, but I know for myself and what I hear from other people, that seems to be one of the more challenging pieces of everything that you're saying. 
you know, sure, this happens. So, so how do I accept it? Why is it so difficult to just accept this is what it is? Yeah, I, I don't. I think that's a very, a very individual question. Uh, I think everybody's going to struggle at their own levels with uh, accepting. But, but you know, I, I, I can speak, I guess, personally for me. Um, and the, it, you know, we, we, we come at life, we come at circumstances, um, events, contexts. We come at all of this with um with hopes with preferences some of them sometimes very strong preferences and the 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 more we have these the, the 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 more tightly we hold on to what we want things to be like the harder it is to accept what is especially when it's not you know, in line with those preferences or desires. And so one of the more challenging things for me is to learn to loosen my grip on my preferences mm-hmm. and to realize that, yes, I, I, I would like for things to be a particular way, um, but if they're not, um, you know, I, I, I need to learn to, to loosen my grip on those preferences. Um, I read a, I read, I read a quote, uh, that's, uh, it's a Zen quote and it's designed to, um, to be something that really, um, shakes you up and, uh, awakens something within you. And I read this, uh, line, uh, months ago and it, and it really resonated within me. And it's, it's one that I've now taken on as my own. Uh, and it's not that it's true all the time, but it reminds me of uh, where I need to be. And here's the, here's the line it says, there is nothing I dislike. Hmm. Now, I mean, obviously that's not true. There's a lot of things that I dislike. Exactly. Um, but but if, if I can just keep that firmly planted in my head, I might it might help me remember that when I encounter something that is not the way I would prefer it to be, it's time for me to loosen my preferences, to loosen my grip on my preferences and just accept whatever is. It may not be comfortable. It may not be fun. It may not be what I wanted, but if it's what it is, I'm going to be better off if I can move into that space of just accept radical acceptance of whatever it is and and then trying to bring to it the action that I can take within the context it, because if I hold on to my preferences of you know what I wish what would have been then I'm still struggling against what is and I'm not able to actually take action to um, to, to influence or to create the reality that I really would like to have within within whatever it is and, and that's very interesting. I, I'm going to have to spend some time reflecting on the quote because um, uh, it's one of those things when, when I hear that quote, it's like when I read some that they kind of stick with me and I'm not too sure why. And yeah. That's one of them. So I'm, I'm going to have to reflect on that and I, I appreciate you sharing that. And, and I think part of it is because of that, you know, dichotomy that, you know, you, you look at that quote and think, well, there's a lot of things that I don't like. But then I look at it and go, but it's a Zen quote, so there's got to be something deeper to this. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, you know, I, I, I like what you're saying within that piece uh, of the acceptance. So if we're looking at making these changes, and especially in, in the habit changes, where, where would we go from acceptance? What, what's going to help us, uh, you know, to break free from uh, the, this cycle that we're in? Well, I mean, you know, depending on what the cycle is, I mean, and depending right. on what it is um, that you know, an individual is trying to break free from, um, I mean, obviously, as we've said, I mean, acceptance of what is is the first step. But once, but once you've accepted things the way they are, then you can look at what is 
Look at the actual thing, not the story you're creating in your head or the preferences that you're holding on to. But you can just look at the circumstance. And then you can ask, start asking yourself this question, you know, what can I do? What are actions that I can take within this realm, within this situation? And, you know, depending on what the situation is and what, you know, if it's a, if it's a habit or if it's something else that, that we're trying to break free from, then, you know, then there are particular steps that can be taken to uh, help elevate one's awareness of the response that uh, one brings to situations and trying to try, I, uh, I'll, I'll encourage my clients to, um, to uh, track what I call the habit cycle um, that's, you know, moving you from trigger to thought to action and really trying to unpack and digest how we act out of habit uh, given certain triggers that mm -hmm. move us into operating without even thinking about it. And, and trying to really slow down the habit cycle and understanding what habitual actions are being taken and what, why they're being taken. It, it, it's when we do that that we can start to really um, deconstruct those destructive habits and take the action to replace them with more positive ones. How important do you see the positive ones? And it may seem like a, a dumb question or an obvious question, but I think people need to hear more of positives because we're, you know, and I, I've been doing a um, substance addiction work for over 20 years. And, you know, it, it's always about at least the way I look at it, you know, negatives, you know, we'll stop doing this, stop doing that, stop, you know, and, and it's all of these negative things and, and it's rare to hear uh, you know, well, what can you do on the positive end or what is the positive nature of what you're choosing to do versus all of these, well, just eliminate all those things from your life, which you have to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah I yeah. wonder if we're missing the positive or, or not emphasizing the positive enough. I, I think, um, I think the positive is the absolute key. Um, and, and here's why I'm going to tell you about a book that I read. Uh, well, I'm going to take another quote. Um, again, my, my coach and, and, and friend Craig Paris says to break a habit, you have to make a habit. I'm sure that was been said before him, but I mean, they're, you know, he's the, he's the one I got it from. Um, also I, I read last year, I read this great book by Charles Duhigg called the power of habit. And one of the things that Duhigg says in that, in that book is that habits don't disappear. Habits don't just go away, but they can be replaced. So I think, and, and, and what I, from what I've learned is, if you identify any kind of compulsive, destructive habit that, needs to, that, that, that you want to get rid of, where most people fail and wind up not ending that habit or stopping that thing, is because they focus only on not doing that thing. As you said, it's to focus on the stop doing that thing. Mm -hmm. And, and that's important. We, we need to stop doing that thing, but long-term focus on not doing that thing is what are you focusing on? You're still focusing on that thing, that negative thing that you're running away from. Right. And so I, I think, I know for me personally and for the guys I work with, it's one thing to spend some time really getting a hold of the negative behavior, whatever it is. Stop doing the thing. But at some point, we need to shift gears and start asking the question, what, now, what am I going to replace this thing with? And, and the way I phrase that question is, what kind of life do you want to have? What kind of person, what kind of man do you want to be? And, and we start to unpack together really cultivating healthy habits in various areas of our lives that will ultimately replace those negative habits with healthy, constructive ones. So I think it's it, not, not just focusing on positive habit cultivation, 
I think it's actually a matter of replacing those negative destructive habits with ones that are going to be positive and uplifting and, and producing the actual kind of life that you want to live. Uh, I really appreciate what you're saying because over the last few years of me working in the substance abuse field, that's where I started going with it. And I, I kind of feel bad that earlier in my career, I was never taught that, uh, yeah. you know, of emphasizing the positives and, um, you know, I, I don't think I necessarily did a disservice over those years, but you wonder how much more fulfilling a recovery could have been had we been teaching addiction counselors back then to do more of this positive work, right? Uh, you know, rather than all the negatives. But that that's just you know my speculation reflection. But um, you know, one of the things that I noted in in what you're uh, working on is when you talk about the compulsive behaviors and somewhere that I read uh, uh, about you, th there was a statement about um, using mindfulness with the science of habit change. Yeah. I was wondering if you could spend some time talking about what is the science of habit change? So, so that's really what I'm trying to get at with that is, is really looking at what cognitive science is telling us about habits and habit formation? Um, you know, I, I mentioned already Charles Duhigg uh, and his work, uh, which uh, I, I does, does a lot with, um, with, 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 with neuroscience and with the way that habits um, are born, the way that habits are reinforced, and the way habits can be, um, can be changed from a neuroscience perspective. It's not all neuroscience. It's not that, 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 that heavy of a book. Um, but it, but he does get into a good, a good bit of that. But, you know, there is, there's just such significant and rich work that's been done uh, over the past, you know, decade or two and, and more, but you know, the, the, you know, the, uh, the, there's, there's, there's more and more work being done all the time. Um, from, you know, in the, from the cognitive sciences within neuro, uh, neuroscience, uh, this idea of neuroplasticity that, you know, your brain's not just fixed, it can be changed. And now that, that the, the ways that we can shift our thinking um, around habits and compulsive behaviors, but around you know, that, that, like I mentioned earlier, that negative narration that goes on in so many people's heads, mm -hmm. um, shifting your thinking around that. Um, that's what I'm getting at with the science of habit change. The, the, the neuroscience, the cognitive science around habit formation and, and how to shift those things. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm really pleased with that we're seeing more and more research that's showing what you were mentioning and, and as well as a lot of the mindfulness practices that it, it's no longer just the off the cuff remarks of people saying, I, I feel better. Uh, it's not just the anecdotal stories about how it's, you know, helping me in my life, but we're actually showing scientifically that there are physical benefits mm -hmm. to us. So if we start making some of these changes that you've been talking about and that mindfulness would, uh, you know, promote. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. There's, I mean, it seems like, you know, there's uh, new studies coming out all the time that, that are demonstrating, uh, you know, some of the most interesting things for me are to, to, to look at some of these, uh, some of these brain scan studies where people are looking at the brain scans of, of people that are uh, practicing mindfulness and, uh, you know, using that to, to, to shift perspectives. And, um, and the, the, the ways that the places in our brain fire or don't fire, it's all very, I mean, it's, it's, it, I'm, you know, I'm not that, I don't have that kind of a PhD, so I'm not that smart in this stuff, but, um, but it's, but it's Normally very fascinating, so. but it's very fascinating. And, uh, and, and, and it does, it does uh, give some kind of demonstrable evidence that, you know, this stuff that we're talking about actually does have real benefit. 
Yeah, and, and that's what I, I love to see because, you know, so many people, when you talk about things such as what we're talking and, and name it mindfulness and, you know, so many people say, well, that's wonderful, but well, now that we're getting the science behind it, we don't need that but to it. Now we can be saying, you know, it's wonderful because and yeah. they start listing, you know, these studies as can be done with many other evidence-based, uh, you know, psychology theories that this now puts it on, on the same, uh, same level and the same power with, uh, you know, all of those. So, yeah. yeah, I think this is a wonderful time to be in because we can really back this up now to uh, people who are just really skeptical. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So as we're coming up a bit on uh, the time and all, what would you like to share that maybe we haven't gotten to or something that uh, you think we would uh, need to expand a bit more on so that people can, uh, you know, more fully understand this? Well, I, I think, you know, the, the thing we haven't spent much time on, and I'll, we won't spend uh, a lot of time here because we're almost out of time, but I would, I would say that did a really key, a, a key for me uh, in my personal life and a key that I have seen with the clients I've worked with in uh, taking action, you know, shifting habits, making this kind of, you know, life change to improve the quality uh, of your life. A, a, a critical component of that is practicing mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people, I've, I started this over on my YouTube channel. I'm doing a, I'm doing a, 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 a few videos on this new book, that, that, a new book that's come out on meditation. And I just find it really fascinating. And, um, and, and one of the things that, 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 that's going to come out of that is this idea, you know, a lot of people say, well, I just can't meditate. I can't clear my mind. There, I think there's such a wide misconception about what meditation actually is. Um, uh, Cause a lot of people think it's, you know, I've got to like not think and I've got to clear my mind. And what I try to tell people is actually meditation is more about changing your relationship with your thoughts than it is not thinking. Because your brain's going to think thoughts. That's what's going to happen. Your, your brain is built to think. And you're going to sit down. And I tell people, you're going to sit down to start meditating. And you're going to f- start focusing on your breath. And you're going to start thinking. That It, it happens to everybody. The, the challenge is, every time you think and you get sidetracked and distracted and lost in a thought, eventually you'll realize, oh, I'm supposed to be paying attention to my breath, not thinking about what I'm going to, you know, serve for lunch next Saturday when my in-laws come over. When you realize that, you can just drop the thought, let it go, and then come back to your breath. And then wait for the next time you get distracted, and when you realize you've been distracted, let that thought go and come back to your breath. Dan Harris says, every time you do that, it's like doing a bicep curl for your brain. And it really is. It's like, like that. that is, that is, you're training your brain two things. You're training your brain to focus on something. You're training yourself to focus on something. And you're training, you're teaching yourself that those thoughts that occur in your head, they're not you and you don't have to listen to them. And that can be particularly helpful when those negative voices pop up and you need to be reminded that that's not you. You don't have to listen to it. Yeah. And that's so important to look at that just because we have a thought doesn't make it true and doesn't mean that as you say you know what what i'm thinking doesn't mean it's me and i like how you're putting it because when i look at the definition of mindfulness from uh john kabat zinn when he talks about the word um you know unjudgmentally you know without that judgment to Mm -hmm. you know just experience what you're experiencing 
and then come back and breathe and experience it and come back and breathe that, yeah, this yeah. isn't the time for us to put the judgment to it. Life just is, which I guess brings us full circle back to acceptance. Yeah, it really does. It really does. And, and, but I mean, I mean, I would take it a step further and say, um, you know, this is not just about thoughts, but it's about emotion. Um, right. You, you don't, you, just because you feel anger, that doesn't mean that you are angry and that you have to act on that. What you can do is learn to, you can learn to create some critical distance there and realize right now I'm experiencing anger and this is what it feels like. It doesn't feel very good. <laughs> it's not very pleasant, but, mm -hmm. but, but that, that kind of regulation is what can help you, um, can, can, can help free you from being enslaved to your mind, to your mind dictating what you think about and how you act. You, you don't have to do that. Right, exactly. And so many of us get stuck with that. And yeah. that's why I said at the beginning uh, of this podcast episode, you know, that, that empowering nature, that if, if we begin to understand that I have that ability to change what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling becomes very empowering that regardless of what's happening around me, I am still empowered in that sense that I can make mm -hmm. those changes within. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's just awesome stuff. I, I really appreciate uh, your time and, and explaining this and, a very succinct and, and practical way. Um, it's what's been a the pleasure. best way for people to get a hold of you who uh, want to learn more about what you're doing or your services? Uh, probably easiest way is colemanbaker.org. Um, I'm all over social media. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, got a new YouTube channel, so I'm uh, putting some videos up there. Um, if you go to colemanbaker.org, you'll um, just, you know, you can read about who I am, what I do. And uh, there are links to all my social media there. So you can uh, find me through there. You Sounds can also awesome. get, so, I mean, you can also click the get in touch with me button and send me an email that way too. Perfect. And I'll make sure on the show notes that that uh, web link is there. So it'll be an easy way for people to just click over and then, uh, hear more about what you're doing and, and the services that you offer. So again, I really appreciate you being with us and uh, sharing your wisdom on this topic uh, and hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode. And I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. If you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you for listening. And have a very mindful day. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.